Okay, so we are going through again the series of Acts. Now, I do apologize. It is a big, big chapter that we're going through. It's, about a, it's quite a lot. It's over 50 verses. So bear with me as we try to do the English for the English um, speakers so they can also be spiritually filled just as the Tongans uh, were. So again, we're remembering through Paul's travels, he comes and he finally gets to Jerusalem. Now, as he's in Jerusalem, there's a lot of things that happen, but I'll explain those things as we go through it. Now, I've got it up there. Point one is from verses 17 to 26, and that is serving God's ministry will come with rumors to dishearten the church. Now, it's there. I'll read it for you. You guys can just have a, have a look there, and I'll read it. Um, I've highlighted the points there, so it can kind of point, jump out on you, and I'll explain it as we go through. All right, verse 17. So when we reached Jerusalem... The brothers and sisters welcomed us warmly. The following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified God and said, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children, or to live according to our customs. So what is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have made a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they were told about you amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are also careful about observing the law. With regard to the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what he strangled, and from sexual immorality. So the next day, Paul took the men, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering would be made for each of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is, this is how it's going. Paul's there, and then he goes to the church. Now, the church is very happy to receive him. And they are happy to hear of what's been going on with the Gentiles. But, as, you, as we're reading, you can tell that there is something that's happening. And they're saying, they're accusing Paul, or not really accusing, already rumours. Now, when I say rumours, what I'm trying to say is they got the wrong idea. Right? So, they heard Paul's teaching these things against the law. And then he has, they asked him, can you do this, make a vow, uh, so that way... The other Jews that hear it, um, they will know that it's not true. Right? It's all a lie. Um, and it's just what they thought it was, but they don't actually know Paul's gospel and what he was preaching to the Jews. Now, he wasn't really preaching to not follow the law, as uh, it talks about in Romans. So if you want to look it up, Romans. It's not that he's saying don't follow the law. He's saying the law can't save you. Right? It's a salvation for the Jews is from Jesus, and that's the world as well. The salvation for all of us is from Jesus. He's telling them the law can't save you. Circumcision and all that cannot save you. It's Jesus that saves you. But they had, again, wrong idea because of what rumors they heard. Now, we know that serving God's ministry, they, it comes with all these things. You might hear it. It comes with rumors, and it's designed to kind of discourage you. It's designed to uh, discourage the church. Now, these are people in the church. James and the elders, these are people that believe in Jesus. And even they were trying to tell Paul, look, we've been hearing, there's a lot of Jews that's hearing the wrong thing about you, the wrong idea. So they tell him to take a vow. And, And that's the same as we are today. When we hear rumors, we address the situation. If you hear a rumor or if you hear the wrong idea, and you'll hear it out there, especially among the Tongan churches and even the English now, they're uniting, they don't go by the gospel. They'll say to you, what are you preaching about in your church? Are you preaching the Bible or are you preaching that what they always preach, that God is love, so he loves everyone. doesn't matter whether you're homosexual or not. You can still, he'll still love you. The Bible tells us that's, oh, that's, not, that's not who God is. But the other churches out there, that's what they tell you and they want you to believe. 
And then they'll start spreading rumours about us, about the church. I hear you guys are doing different things, new things. This is not new. It's been in the word for thousands of years. We're just repeating what it's saying. A lot of people now, they don't listen to it. They twist it because it doesn't suit what it is that they want to hear. But when we hear rumours, we address the situation. We don't let it divide us. Don't let it seep into you like the yeast of like unleavened bread, right? You know, the yeast goes in the bread, mixes up. If you get any type of bad things, it'll mix with you. And everything that you see is just bad. Doesn't matter how good it is, because you, you're already mixed with all the bad, that's what it would look like. But Paul does take a vow, and we take the same vow with Christ, right? We do the same, and we don't divide ourselves. We come together. When we hear things, we come together. We glorify God, but we also work together to address these situations. And if those are the people out there that address you in this way, correct them. Just say, no, this is what it tells me in the Word of God. Correct them. Don't be afraid. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 to 16, I got up there. But as the one who called you is holy, you are also to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So in everything we do, see, even if the church told Peter, Paul, do this and pay for this, he did it. All our conduct we do here, we do it to glorify God. And we do it because he is a holy God. And it shows that we are different from everyone else. Now, the best defense against wrong ideas or rumors is to do the right thing all the time, especially if it costs you personally. That's very hard. No one wants to do anything if it's going to cost them personally. Look at today. The stadium at uh, Parramatta is probably 30,000 people there. There's no one in the churches. It cost. I bought a ticket and I wanted to go, but I couldn't. I really want to come here because I know God was going to bring people here to hear his word. This is my ministry, but I struggle as well daily. Okay? And we too as a church will struggle when people will try and do rumours to dishearten you. Don't let it go through. Don't let it seek in here. Come and speak. If you hear something about the faith of goals, pastors, come and speak to them. Address it. Don't be afraid. Point two is from verses 27 to 39. And that is, Satan uses assumptions to attack God's church, but God sends help for us to continue in the ministry. Now, what I mean by assumptions is, again, it's similar to rumours, but assumptions is more just their thinking and they answer their own question. Right? They don't go and seek the answer. They assume something and they answer it themselves, which is incorrect. But let me read it for you from verses 27 to 39. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. What's more, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they, are previous, they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was stirred up and the people rushed together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. As they were trying to kill him, Word went up to the commander of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in chaos. Taking along soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them. Seeing the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander approached, took him into custody, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. Since he was not able to get reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered him to be taken into the barracks. When Paul got to the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mass of the people followed, yelling, get rid of him. As he was about to be brought into the barracks, Paul said to the commander, am I allowed to say something to you? He replied, you know how to speak Greek. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt some time ago and led 4,000 men of the, Assyrian, of the assassins into the wilderness? Paul said, I am a Jewish man from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. Now I ask you, let me speak to the people. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, when the seven days was nearly over, that's purification rites. 
some Jews from Asia, that's Ephesus, right? that's in Ephesus, came and saw Paul in the temple. Now they stirred up the crowd and told them to help them seize Paul. As they were seizing Paul, they were saying, this man is teaching everyone everywhere against Jews, their laws, and the temple All right, in Jerusalem, even adding that he brought Greeks into the holy place. Now, when you look at the temple of Jerusalem, there's an inner part. The inner part is only for Jews. There's an outer court and an inner court. The outside is where Gentiles are. Gentiles can't go inside the court. If you go inside there and you're Gentile, you're, you, it's punishable by death. Right, so that's why they were saying Paul defiled, because they assumed by seeing Trophimus from Ephesus that he brought him into the holy side, the holy part of the temple. See the wrong idea? They didn't understand. They didn't get it. They didn't go and check if it was right. They just assumed, and they fired away and stirred the crowd. Now, as Paul was getting beaten up, the word went to the commander and he came with his soldiers and then he bound Paul. And the crowd, when they seen it, they stopped. Now they really tried to kill him, but they couldn't. And then the, he had to correct, Paul had to correct the commander. The commander thought he was an Egyptian leading a, revolu a, a revolt, but he wasn't. Paul tells him, no, I am a citizen of Tarsus, right? Roman city, a uh, Roman citizen from this city. Now we begin to see that what was happening to Paul that was told by Agabus in Acts 21 verse 11 is beginning to be fulfilled. All right, so we can see how dangerous assumptions can be. So if you have an answer or you have a question that you need to be, that needs to be addressed, ask. You know, when you hear things outside about our church and you don't really know it, come and ask. Come and ask ma'afu or when you, we're not someone that's so high that you can't approach us. Don't look at us like that. We are servants like Paul. We are servants like Paul. But see, when you don't know the things and when people start assuming ideas to you and f telling you things, if you don't come and check, get them checked out, you, this is what will happen you'll start running with the crowd, not knowing whether it's true or not. Now, as we are in here, these are now unbelievers. Remember the first part, the rumors, was to the believers. Now, they gathered the whole city, unbelievers. It's beginning to get attacked a lot more now. We see inside the church and outside of the church. But we aren't worried about it because we know the ministry does Everyone tries to attack it that doesn't believe in Christ. So don't lose hope. Don't lose heart when these things happen to us. These are to test us, to see if we strengthen ourselves to really rely on the word of God and Jesus. Don't trust on your knowledge. Don't trust on your strength or your youth. Don't trust on that. You trust in God that can save us. Right? And he uses people to strengthen us in the church. We have plenty here, plenty here that are serving Christ genuinely. Come to them. Don't assume things and don't walk out this door without knowing what it is you truly trust in. Trust in Jesus who is able to help us. Now, see the unbelievers out there could be like the Tongan churches today. They say, why are you preaching against women preachers? Where does that say? It tells us there in the Bible that we say all the time, why do you wear head covering? Is that a new practice? No, it's not. It's a practice that's been there for a very long time. See the unbelievers that will keep assuming things in order for you to be disheartened so you can move away from Christ. Look behind who's actually behind that causing the assumptions, who's behind doing the rumors. It's Satan. He is the one that wants to remove you from you. Then let him remove you. Proverbs verse 18, chapter 18, verse 13. The one who gives an answer before he listens, this is foolishness and disgrace for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So again, assumptions. Don't assume. A lot of us Tongans like to hold it in. And English people, we like to hold it in and just guess. 
oh, yeah, I heard this is the thing, and, yeah, I think he was trying to do this. No, don't do that. Just go and ask him, excuse me. I heard this, and is this true or not? That's it. End of story. Don't let it mold in here. Don't let it come and seep into your heart. Otherwise, it will remove you from who uh, is actually trying to save you, which is Jesus. Now, the third point is, is from Acts chapter 21, verses 40 to Acts 22, 19. And that is, our testimony is always about God and his saving gospel through Jesus. After he had given permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned with his hand to the people. When there was a great hush, he addressed them in Aramaic. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense before you. When you heard that he was addressing them in Aramaic, they became even quieter. He continued, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strictness of our ancestral law. I was zealous for God, just as all of you are today. I persecuted this way to the death, arresting and putting both men and women in jail, as both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. After I received letters from them to the brothers, I traveled to Damascus to, te- to arrest those who were there and bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was traveling and approaching Damascus, about noon, an intense light from heaven suddenly flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. I said, What should I do, Lord? The Lord told me, Get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told everything that you have been assigned to do. Since I couldn't see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me, went into Damascus. Someone named Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, had a good reputation with all the Jews living there, came and stood by me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And in that very hour, I looked up and saw him. And he said, The God of our ancestors appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. Since you will be a witness for him to all people, of what you have seen and heard, and now, why are you delaying? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. After I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple. I fell into a trance and saw him telling me, hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. But I said, Lord, they know that it is that in synagogue after synagogue, I had those who believed in you imprisoned and beaten. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I stood there giving approval and guarding the clothes of those who killed him. He said to me, go, because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Paul begins to speak to the crowd in Aramaic. So that is the Hebrew language back then. Even though he can talk Greek, right, as he's speaking Greek to, um, to the commander. Now he tells them to listen to his defense and testimony. Now he starts at the beginning, verse 3, right? Jew study, he's a Jew, studied under Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel was one of the greatest scholars uh, in, of his time, right? So that is Jewish scholar. Um, and how, in verse 4, he persecuted the followers of the way. The way is the followers of Jesus, the Christians. Verse 5 to 11, the high priest and the council can also testify that he went up to Damascus to persecute this church, or Jesus' followers, right? On his way there, and he talks about how he was converted, how he was told by Jesus, um, and he was, ended up being blinded by the light. People that was with him saw the light but didn't hear the voice. They led him in to the city. Verse 12 to 14, it talks about how a devout Jew in Damascus, according to the law, with a good reputation on the, on the command by Jesus to heal him. Right? And Ananias tells Paul that God of our answers has appointed him that's Paul, to know his will to see the righteous one and to hear the words from his mouth. Now, see, in verses 5 to 16, Paul is a witness. He is to be a witness to all people of what he has seen and heard, and he gets baptized, washes away his sins, calling on the name of Jesus. Verse 17 to 19, after that, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. He, in a vision, gets told to leave because they will not accept his testimony. And he's going to send him to uh, the Gentiles, even though he had a good reputation amongst the Jewish people because he was there. He persecuted them. He approved of them killing Stephen. 
See, this is how we all were at one time. We were all persecutors of Jesus. We, yeah, we were. Don't tell me that when you were young that you went to church all the time because that's not true. Because we know that as a fact. When we, we were all poor, what Paul was, zealous for the Lord. And we did things that we thought was best for us before we knew Christ. We, there's still people that still do it today. Right? But that was our old self. We don't rely on that anymore. And that's how people will look at you. They would look at you based on your former, your former life. They won't know how you came to Jesus or that your life has changed, if it's changed through the gospel. That is how a lot of people will judge you today. They would look at your past. Families, especially families, very hardest. They, they are the hardest to change. Right? They will judge you on everything on your past. But we continue on and we continue to testify by living the gospel that we've changed. Our approval is not to them no longer. Our approval is to Jesus. We do what is right in Jesus' eyes. So we continue to test. When we do our testimony, we tell the story, yes, but it's got to be God-centered. It's got to be Christ-centered. He is this hero in your story, not you. Don't tell your story about how you were this and that and that. Tell the story of how Christ saved you. Paul is telling them, I was like you. Christ saved me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from all of them, from them all. In fact, all who wants to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus will be persecuted. So, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, you want to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. Expect it. But don't think that you are on your own. We have a church here that's being persecuted the same way. We have Christ who's promised to never leave us. So we are never alone. Don't think you're on your own. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, before we were persecutors of Christ, yes? Now, we are being persecuted. Why? Because we no longer live the former life. Right? We're not, no longer our old self, but we live the godly life in Christ, which will come with persecutions. So don't be disheartened. You are not alone. The last point is Acts chapter 22, and that is from verse 20 to 29. Um, and this is, we the church must stand firm in our heavenly citizenship through Jesus against all persecutions. Uh, verse 22, they listened to him up to this point. Then they raised their voices, shouting, wipe this man off the face of the earth. He should not be allowed to live. As they were yelling and flinging aside their garments and throwing dust in the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, directing that he be interrogated with the scourge to discover the reason they were shouting against him like this. As they, were stretched, as they stretched him out for the lash, Paul said to the centurion standing by, Is it legal for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen and is uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went and reported to the commander, saying, What are you going to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he said. The commander replied, I bought this citizenship for a large amount of money. But I was born a citizen, Paul said. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. The commander, too, was alarmed when he realized Paul was a Roman citizen and he had him bound. Are this the word of the Lord? Thanks be to God. So quick summary uh, on this part of the chapter. They listened to Paul up to the point when he said he will be sent away to the Gentiles. Right? Now they were angry because I'm guessing Israel, I mean, Israel is God's people, possessions. And they were yelling for his death. They didn't know, couldn't quite grasp why he would go to save the Gentiles instead of the Jews. But as they were yelling, the commander ordered him into the barracks to be interrogated by the scourge. Now, the scourge is a whip. If you think of your belt buckle, but put like spikes and bones and that on it, that's the, that's the whip, right? And that's what the Romans used to do to find out reasons. 
And that's what they wanted to do to Paul here, to find out why he's, these people going off. Now, they were about to be uh, to whip Paul, uh, but when Paul mentioned that he was born a citizen, the guy, the centurion soldier, was afraid. He ended up going back to the commander and telling him, look, Paul is saying he's a Roman citizen. The commander came and said, I bought this citizenship. I'm a citizen as well. I bought it. Paul said, I didn't buy it. I was born a citizen. It's the big difference, right? They were very afraid because they bound him. Now, Paul's under Caesar. If they break the law, it's almost like they're breaking the law against Caesar, right? They're rebelling. So if they, you'd be very afraid if you were to bound one of the citizens under Caesar, right? So most of us are citizens in this world. Most of us are either Tongan citizens or Australian, New Zealand or Tongan. We are dual citizens in this world. Now, the heavenly citizenship that we have is not due. It's not where you can be the world and be heavenly. It's only one. It's only one citizenship. You can't be both. You can't be worldly and you can't be a heavenly citizen. All right, so we stand firm in Jesus knowing our citizenship is in heaven. So even if we are about to be persecuted, about to be whipped, I'm not going to give it up. Because of pain? No. That citizenship is given by Christ. You can't buy this citizenship in heaven. You can't buy it. doesn't matter how rich you are. You can't afford it. No one can afford it. And you can't buy it. Unlike the commander who could buy his citizen. We as a church, we have our citizen in heaven. Philippians chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. Now this is where it shows there's two different citizenships, right? Where their end is destruction. That is, those that don't belong to heaven. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. And they are focused on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await for a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, word of encouragement today. Don't give up. If you are being persecuted, don't give up. You have a citizen. You are under God's authority. You can't lose this citizenship. Stay with it. Don't let it go for the worldly things. Worldly things will perish. Don't lose your citizenship that Christ has given you once we all, when we gave our life to him. Now, this is just a summary before we finish. Let's pray. Let's pray that we don't allow the wrong idea to dishearten us. When we hear people spreading rumours and assumptions, let us pray that we don't allow that to dishearten us from the gospel. We also let us pray that any time we testify about the changes in our life, it's Christ-centered. It's all about Jesus, not us. And let's pray that when persecutions come from inside the church and outside, that we don't give up our heavenly citizenship in Jesus. Amen.